spectacular job with Mitsubishi, but he's also become my friend over this period. And so I said, would you please do a session with us? Would you explain what this opportunity is like for both of us, for Japan and for the United States? Gosh, we need it. Um, we're not, we're not so humble as to admit that we do need it, but I, let's be honest, we, could, we should be drawing on expertise forever we can find it, and it certainly is rich expertise in Japan that could be a real asset for us. So could I ask you, with your applause, please welcome warmly Mr. Kojima, who's going to explain the results of the commission that the Prime Minister established. Kojima-san, please. Well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity <clears throat> to speak before you about the uh, proposal uh, that our study group published nearly a month ago, just after the uh, U.S. presidential election. I am, uh, as uh, introduced, uh, Yorihiko Kojima. Uh, honorary Chairman of the uh, Board of Mitsubishi Corporation. And uh, I had uh, the privilege to serve as a member of the uh, 2016 study group in Japan-U.S. economy, which was uh, launched uh, this September at the uh, request of Foreign Minister Kishida. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Hamre and the CSIS for hosting uh, this event, especially Mr. Matthew Goodman, uh, for all of the arrangements and the input uh, leading up to this event, as well as uh, for graciously agreeing to be the uh, moderator. With the presidential election gone by, many of both sides of the Pacific feel that the uh, Japan-U.S. relationship is at uh, crossroads. Whether or not that may be uh, true, it remains that the uh, strong Japan-U.S. relationship is uh, vital, not just for the two countries, but for the Russia, Asia, Pacific region, and the world. As a member of the private sector and having spent time engaged in international business, I can say that the benefits escaped from a robust bilateral relationship are not confined to a more foreign policy or a government spectrum but have uh, significant uh, linkages to um, the impact on the private sector. This aspect may be uh, increasingly true in the recent years, where international affairs have uh, become more multifaceted and uh, intertwined at the risk of uh, oversimplification, the current <coughs> global economy is facing a prolonged stagnation of productivity together with leaning toward trade protectionism. Protectionism, yes. In times like uh, these, uh, strong Japanese-U.S. economic relations are all the more important with a view to drive growth and prosperity in both countries and continued to be a champion of free trade. Thus, we must set our sights on further enhancing and expanding the bilateral economic ties that have grown over the years. This kind of thinking has been a common thread throughout the discussions of the study group while we asked ourselves questions such as 
What kind of Japan-U.S. economic relationship should we pursue in order for Japan to grow and prospect? Then the next one is how should Japan and the U.S. work together in order for both Japan and the United States to grow and prosper? As well as how should Japan and the U.S. keep jointly playing a uh, leading role in the uh, Asia-Pacific region for the sake of the region's growth and the prosperity. Let me touch upon some of the main points of the proposal, while also commenting on the uh, underlying ideas. The study group conducted uh, a, uh, discussions against the uh, backdrop of the questions I mentioned, taking into account the current state of the global economy and the Japan-US bilateral economic relationship. Upon holding a series of targeted discussions, we drafted the proposed consisting of four pillars. The first pillar stresses the uh, need for further promotion and uh, deepening of the uh, Japan-U.S. economic relationship and for promotion of uh, cooperation based on this relationship. We laid out 10 areas where Japan and the U.S. should join hands on the foundation of the bilateral relationship. Infrastructure is the top of the list because we felt a positive linkage can certainly be achieved between Japan's uh, competitive and advantage in infrastructure and the U.S. domestic demand for improved infrastructure. As uh, many of you know, the president-elect has indicated the infrastructure as a key area to work on so I'd like to think that our study group was far-sighted in this respect. Another area we raised was cooperation in the development of cutting-edge technologies. Perhaps Ms. Ishiguro can provide insight into this topic in the panel discussion following my remarks. If the pr first pillar were the what of future Japan-U.S. economic relations, then the second pillar will be the uh, how, not what. How Japan and the U.S. approach areas of cooperation is uh, uh, Yeah, and uh, is just as important as a sustainable substance. Enough, even though government-to-government -government dialogue is still effective to maximize cooperation, multi-level dialogues uh, that are inclusive of the array of players, including private companies, local governments, universities, think tanks, and uh, congressional or diet members should be uh, pursued. While this is not a uh, new concept, the study group hopes that both governments proactively promote multi-level dialogues uh, mindful of when and where the involvement of uh, certain actors would be most effective. In the third pillar, we have included the need to exercise Japan-U.S. leadership towards advan advancing free trade. There has been no shortage of speculation on the fate of TPP in the past months. But we must not forget that the foundation of Japan-U.S. economic 
ties. Forget that the foundation of Japan, U.S. economic ties stands on the benefits garnered through trade and investment between the two countries and bearing in mind and the strategic value of TPP in building a new economic order in the Asia-Pacific region with like-minded uh, like uh, partners. The study group continues to stand behind the uh, importance of Japan and the U.S. to play a leading role in pursuing for the early into force of the agreement. In light of the uh, amicable meeting between Prime Minister Abe and Mr. Trump, we hope the path towards P TPP will be paved by the efforts on both sides. The fourth and the final pillar emphasize the need for the strategic public-private partnership. The proposal highlights the role Japanese companies have played over the years, particularly in nurturing and solidifying grassroots level connection in the U.S. We feel that there is untapped potential in which both governments can develop means to make the best use of Japanese companies' influence in strengthening the uh, Japan-U.S. relationship and to deal with various challenges. I will not uh, go into details today and will leave it to the next segment for further discussion. But I do hope that the uh, proposal will be taken into consideration by the Japanese government and even perhaps be helpful for my fellow U.S. friends. Cooperation may be a worn-out term that no longer catches the attention of the people, but this goes to show how much cooperation between Japan and the U.S. has become a well-rooted concept that is inflective uh, of the details, uh, re uh, realities of the uh, bilateral relationship. Cooperation is what brings Japan and the U.S. together. So we must not stop asking ourselves how we can advance the uh, bilateral economic relationships. I st strongly believe that the uh, way forward is to expand the horizon of cooperation between Japan and the U.S., and the study group developed this proposal precisely with the, that frame of mind. Moreover, as I said at the outset, it cannot be emphasized enough that the rich and robust Japan-US cooperation has positive ripple effects in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. By ensuring that the bilateral economic relationship is deepened, that will in turn underpin trade and investment in the region and the world. In this sense, we all have a role to play because every dimension of cooperation matters. The study group hopes the Japanese government will have a similar approach in developing the bilateral economic relationship with the next U.S. administration. And at the same time, the various members of the study group are also keen to take part in this endeavor. Well, in closing, I would like to once again extend my gratitude for this opportunity. And I look forward to discussions among my fellow study group members. Thank you very much. You can stay up there, gentlemen. Please. Oh, okay.
you can come around, uh, Ishiguro san, you can come around this way. And Watanabe sensei, if you want to come this way, you can sure. come around here too. Or you can jump there. If you're comfortable yeah. jumping up there, that's okay. good. On, Travis, yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, well, uh, welcome again to everyone. My name is Matthew Goodman. I uh, hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSAS, and I work on Asian economic uh, policy issues. Uh, delighted to be here to moderate this uh, uh, extraordinary panel of uh, J Japanese um, celebrities, um, at least they are to me, uh, really um, uh, seasoned and, and uh, wise uh, people, all of them, and uh, really. Um, I look forward to getting their more detailed insights following up on Kojima-san's excellent overview of, of what this uh, study group has been working on for the last <coughs> couple of months. Let me say that I'm actually very impressed by this report. Uh, it, I think the work only really began in September, and, and already you have uh, a really um, uh, cogent and clear uh, set of uh, uh, analysis and, and recommendations that that uh, in, in less than two months that seems to have been pulled together. We've been working on a sort of somewhat similar uh, project to advise the new administration on Asian economic strategy. We've been working on it for about 15 months, and it still isn't out, but um, by the way, stay tuned. It is coming out in early January. But So I'm very impressed, and it's got some great, great stuff in here. Um, let me uh, try to tease out some more of the detail by talking to um, the individual panelists. And let me ask you, Nogami-san, first a question. Uh, oh, sorry, I guess I didn't really introduce everyone. Let me, let me go down. You met Kojima-san, honorary chairman of Mitsubishi uh, Corporation. Nogami-san, I think, is, is well known to us, certainly here at CSIS. He is the um, president of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, a uh, former uh, ambassador at the uh, foreign ministry, and he was the director general of the Economics Bureau. I always point out to people because he pretends to be a broad you know, foreign policy expert, but he's really an economics guy. So. Uh, I feel special kinship to him. Um, and then uh, next to him is uh, Fujio Ishiguro, who is president and CEO of Netgear Group Corporation, which is, seems like, you can tell us more, but sort of similar to Salesforce or something in that broad uh, space? They are our partner. We are uh, the biggest uh, digital marketing agency. Digital marketing. Japan. Okay. All right. Uh, digital marketing. Well, I look forward to talking to you about those issues in a second. Welcome. And, uh, and at the end uh, is Professor Yorizumi Watanabe, who's Professor of International Political Economy at uh, Keio University, and also an old uh, CSIS uh, friend. So we, uh, we welcome you all, and, um, and I think we'll uh, get some, some interesting uh, insight from all of you here. Um, so uh, Nogami-san, let me just start by saying, I mean, I started working on U.S.-Japan economic relations in the 1980s, and um, very different period in our relationship. But as I sort of scan that 25, 30 years of time, it's, um, uh, it's not clear to me uh, how we can sort of, just as a basic premise of this exercise, that the US and Japan can sort of start a new, fresh approach. If you think about what we, you know, we spent a couple of decades arguing over trade, um, and then we sort of spent a lost decade of not talking about very much. Um, and then in the last five years, we've been very focused on a very specific objective, working together on TPP. I'm oversimplifying, but I think that's been the, the organizing principle of our relationship over that period. Here you're talking about a kind of broader, comprehensive, uh, cooperative relationship that, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of practice in. So uh, how do you think um, we should approach that? What sort of is dri what's driving us to a new uh, level in our relationship uh, that, that we should think about this differently. The, uh, thank you, uh, Matt. Matt uh, you know, the, uh, the title of this uh, study group uh, uh, says this. Uh, you know, it's a new economic relationship uh, in new era. The uh, uh, slide. Yeah. This is the, uh, the uh, changing pattern of uh, U.S. trade deficit. In the 80s and 90s, the, uh, uh, of course, uh, we are the bad guys. The, uh, nearly 60% uh, you know, of the uh, U.S. trade deficit was due to Japan. But look at the uh, 1916, totally different. 
<coughs> the next please. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, the trend of uh, Japanese uh, foreign direct investment into this country. The, uh, at the moment, we are still second largest investor, but I think uh, given the current uh, sterling rate and uh, Brexit and all that, I think in about a year or two, uh, we will be uh, perhaps the largest investor in the United States. And as a result, next please, we are the second largest uh, employee. Employer. Employer, employer of uh, you know, the, uh, in, in the US. Uh, multinational em you know, employee. And the third, the next one. This one is a very interesting figure. Where we invest, uh, you know, the, uh, the red uh, is, uh, red is uh, the state where our investment is highest. And the pink one is the second. Mm -hmm. Look at all these numbers. And uh, uh, I don't have to explain all these uh, you know, changes. I think, uh, for instance, uh, Governor Pence uh, knows this very well. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, Indiana, for instance, has four Japanese car manufacturers mm -hmm. located. Toyota, Nissan, Honda, and Subaru. Uh, Senate Majority Leader will know this. Uh, Kentucky uh, is, is really uh, hosting a huge number of uh, the, uh, Japanese uh, uh, companies. So uh, these are the sort of uh, uh, changes taking place. And uh, unfortunately, during the uh, presidential campaign from both sides, the narratives are sort of coming back from 80s and 90s. But we are now uh, living in a different world. Uh, this is a new era. 2017 is going to be a totally different from what this, uh, you know, the trade deficit and all that uh, sort of business. Mm -hmm. So this is the backdrop mm -hmm. of uh, our, our report. Okay. All right, well, that's very helpful, and I didn't actually know you had those slides, so that's very, I was going to ask about some of the, the, the changing economic stories, so that's, that's very helpful. Let me, let me come back to that, but let me ask you, skip right to that organizing principle of the last five years, which is TPP. Uh, you spend a lot of time in the report advocating for uh, completion of TPP, and the Japanese government has now, I guess you haven't f quite finished ratification, but you're going to ratify it uh, probably next week, right, in practice, yes. um, in both houses of the, the diet. Um, but here, as you know, uh, the president-elect has already said, in fact, he hasn't talked much about a lot of policy issue matters, that, but he's talked very clearly about TPP and said that he is going to withdraw from TPP um, in his first uh, day or days in office um, and, um, and possibly negotiate bilateral uh, FTAs. So how do, you, how, how do you, coming up against that reality here in this town, how would you talk to the United States about um, about TPP and possible plan B of uh, other things that we could or should be doing, including potentially a bilateral FTA. Is that something that, that people in Japan would find um, interesting? No, I, if uh, you know, the criticism toward the TPP is based on the facts, uh, you know, the uh, uh, sort of understandable, but uh, the, all these uh, you know, the, uh, narratives, uh, negative narratives about the TPP is not really uh, not really based on the, uh, the 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 facts of the TPP. The, uh, call, you know. And uh, I just simply don't understand why uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the 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 general atmosphere of this uh, town is uh, you know really against the TPP. Uh, U.S. will benefit from TPP. This is, uh, this is uh, not our uh, numbers. This is a U.S. ITC report. The uh, annual income will grow, uh, and uh, real GDP will grow, and employment will go up. And uh, the, you're going to have a, the, uh, a huge you know, trade surplus with the other FTA members, the TPP members. So uh, you know, it's, I really don't understand why uh, you know, the, uh, they are so negative about it. Just my plea is very simple. Please take a look at the text of TPP. I, I agree with that. Um, uh, it would be nice. It would be helpful to read it. Uh, read it. Yes. 
Um, okay, I'm going to ask other follow-up mm. questions, but let me bring uh, Ishi. Uh, yes. About bilateral. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Bilateral FTA. You didn't answer that. As what is uh, the Matt, uh, as you put it, uh, you know, the uh, we are just about to ratify uh, by the end of this week or the next week, the, uh, and we are going to be the second one uh, who would uh, ratify uh, only next to New Zealand. And uh, can you ask, uh, you know, Japanese? Uh, uh, parliament, you know, can you go through a, a separate uh, bilateral agreement one week, you know, one, once or twice, you know, and, uh, one, one month or two, two months later, then the you know, very difficult parliamentary ratification process? It's impossible. So, uh, the, and also, what do they expect from bilaterals? You know, al almost everything is done in TPP, bilateral negotiation between Japan and the United States. This was the most difficult part of TPP negotiation, uh, Japan and US bilateral. And uh, on top of that, there are so many sets of rules. And how can you achieve this, the uh, rule uh, aspect through quote unquote bilateral negotiations? I, don't, I simply don't understand. Once again, I plea, please take a look at the text of TPP. TVP itself. Okay, so strong preference for TVP over a bilateral. Well, there may be other questions about that later. Ishigura-san, let me uh, bring you in. So um, you're an expert on cutting-edge technologies, which, uh, which is one of the recommendations in the report, prominently featured. Um, first of all, where do you see the most promising areas for U.S.-Japan cooperation on cutting-edge technologies? What kind of uh, areas of, of cooperation um, uh, are promising? Um, and, and also, to what extent is it necessary, are, are your recommendations about working together on you know, research and development and commercial application of, of technology on the one hand, and how much is, is about um, the policy framework in which uh, that work exists, including the standards that are applied to technology um, around the world? Where I'm, interjecting my own opinion here, but it seems to me there's a lot at stake for the United States and Japan to make sure that global standards around technology are uh, the kind of standards that the U.S. and Japan like to see, as opposed to perhaps um, other potential approaches or standards. And so to what extent are you all recommending that we work together on standard setting for technology, or is this more about actual sort of research cooperation and, and uh, you know, application of technology. Okay. Um, one of the area um, I think uh, prominent is uh, IoT, you know, Internet of Things, because uh, you know Japan is uh, renowned, uh, you know, to uh, develop the uh, very you know so high quality of uh, hardware, and on the other hand, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is a dominant player for Internet service. Well, in a very near future, you know, all the things, all the hardware would have an uh, internet. So, you know, these, you know, so the, you know, area, you know, collaborate with each other, um, but at the same time, you need to, you know, make the, some standard, world standard, you know, working together. That's one of the area I think uh, we can, you know, work together. Um, the other one is uh, kind of controversial, uh, that is artificial intelligence, AI. Um, People argue that um, so globalization or free trade uh, took a job uh, for the people, you know, middle income, you know, low income class who actually support the you know new President Trump during the elect, uh, presidential election campaign. But however, um, that's not really true, you know. So the globalization free trade uh, did not take the job. Actually, technology, you know, took the job. You know, AI accelerate the trend. Mm. So AI definitely uh, bring uh, you know tremendous uh, improvement for productivity and also create a, you know new innovation, new market. But on the other hand, we have to you know keep in mind. You know, this technology has a you know, positive side but a negative side too. You know, the risk is, uh, you know, so labor substitution. 
So the people who support the Trump is exactly the one to expose to the risk. So you know, the both government, you know, listen to private you know, sector and talk to each other and set up uh, the, you know, some system for the people to do the job, you know, give them uh, some alternative. You know, these things is absolutely necessary. It's, it's really coming very soon. So, so you're suggesting that we should be not only talking about, you know, how to collaborate on actually developing artificial intelligence, but at the same time having a, uh, a conversation involving the private sector in that um, about uh, the new labor markets in both countries, how we're going to cope with this new yeah. technology, which is good on the yeah. one hand, but is disruptive yeah. to, uh, to traditional labor right. markets. And so you're suggesting in this that we actually have a, a government to government plus private sector conversation about that. Yes, you know, so both government that. and both government and, uh, you know, private sector understand each other, what the technology is there and what the job opportunity is there. So these things, uh, you know, so my suggestion. Right. We have in the past had, uh, just on the, the sort of the process and format part of this, we have had uh, sort of four-sided tables before in U.S.-Japan relations where we've had the two governments and two private sectors talking about things. Those have been, you know, briefly useful and interesting, but they've sort of petered out in interest. But, um, but you all think that there's there's a place for having that kind of four-sided or maybe eight-sided table because you also seem to suggest that you know um, other players like NGOs and um, yes, NGO, think tanks, maybe even university, um, uh, university think should and be to find out what is a player and uh, you know who is a good at and which, you know, so the. These parties do not understand each other. You know, one side, you know, understand technology. One side understand politics and, uh, you know, the job opportunity. You know, so the, the, you know, one side do not really actually care right. what's going on the other side. Right. So, I see. and then it's actually maybe even a larger table than that, or more <laughs> sides because we were talking earlier about um, state and local uh, governments as well being involved, particularly in when we're talking about infrastructure. But I want to come back to that point, but just to make the point that this, what you all are suggesting is, is a somewhat different approach to our engagement with each other that isn't just government to government, but involving a lot of other parties. Yeah, inclusive. Okay, thank you. Watanabe-sensei, um, you interestingly uh, talk about, pretty frankly, about China, both in the analytical part of the report as, as obviously a new player on the scene, but even in the list of ten priorities for focus, it, one of them, number eight or nine or something, is uh, pushing or encouraging China to be a more responsible uh, player in the international um, community. And, um, and uh, that seems like a, a, good, a, good, uh, a good thing, if we can achieve that. Um, but you focus only on a couple of things specifically, steel overcapacity um, and environment issues, climate change, I presume. Um, and those are good things, and I think, I would think they're important issues, and, and they've been talked about at the G20 level together, G7 level. Um, but is there, um, uh, is there a broader agenda here of, of areas where the U.S. and Japan should be really kind of specifically trying to carve out an agenda that is um, uh, in, our, in our image of what we think is the best way to establish um, rules and, and norms around the world where China has a very different approach. How many other sort of areas do you think there is a, uh, a, a problem here of, of trying to bring out better behavior of China? Are there other areas where we should be, we should be focused? Um, that, that aren't explicitly addressed in this report. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Very challenging question. Um, you see, I'm here to uh, reiterate and also emphasize the importance of uh, TPP, uh, maybe on the uh, basis of three uh, reasons. Uh, one of them is certainly uh, something to do with China. Uh, frankly, um, you know, China uh, was the hidden agenda of the TPP negotiation. Not in the sense that uh, the TPP will play the role of kind of new containment against China, but rather bring China to the, uh, really, the situation where they can perform 
as a, uh, you know, the responsible stakeholder. Uh, and also, you know, they uh, commit themselves with, uh, you know, rule-oriented approach in uh, every aspect of international trade uh, policy projections. So in that sense, I think the, uh, uh, one of the results of the TPP negotiation, that is uh, bring the issue of uh, state-owned enterprises uh, not to uh, discriminate the uh, foreign uh, companies, uh, giving, providing the, uh, uh, the priority to uh, or advantage to state-owned enterprises. So that is certainly one of the elements that we have to uh, look after. Uh, when we think about the positive side of the uh, TPP agreement. And uh, secondary, I'd like to mention that uh, I'd like to draw the attention to uh, the fact that we have no multilaterally agreed trade rules since uh, the end of Uruguay-Iran negotiation. Uh, Uruguay-Iran negotiation ended up in 1994. Uh, since then, we have uh, one agreement, that is trade facilitation agreement, uh, that was agreed on, but no rules on the investment, no rules on competition policy, uh, no clear rules on uh, government procurement. So all these elements, investment, competition, government procurement, they are all included uh, on the agenda of the TPP. So I think the uh, TPP is to fulfill kind of legal vacuum of those uh, new rules uh, related to investment, competition policy, and government procurement. So for that matter, again, you know, Japan and the United States can work very closely. And perhaps uh, we could extend those laws applicable to uh, the trade policy of China in the future. That's another element. And uh, thirdly, I'd like to also mention that uh, TPP is, after all, it's a uh, Japan-US FTA, you see, uh, via you know, 12 nation agreements such as TPP. And uh, since it is a kind of plurilateral agreement uh, involving uh, 12 countries, so it's more dynamic in nature than our simple bilateral FTA between Japan and the United States. So all these three reasons uh, brought me here uh, to emphasize the importance of TPP and on which we could, uh, I mean, Japan and the United States can work uh, even more closely on that. Let me Thank just you. ask a follow-up question before asking Kojima-san a question. Um, would Japan be prepared to modify TPP in some way, not necessarily renegotiating it as, you know, clearly next week it's going to be ratified in Japan, so that may be challenging to reopen the text uh, formally, but in some way with through side agreements or something to address some of the issues that, um, that were raised in the U.S. presidential campaign, not just by Mr. Trump, but by um, several of the candidates, um, whether you know, issues to do with currency, to do with um, uh, uh, the investment uh, uh, rules, which, which are controversial. That's less of a probably an issue between the two of us, but um, any, anything else that might require some modification to to get political support behind TPP, if that's what you ultimately want. Would Japan be willing to entertain some uh, modifications? Well, that's another challenging question, I should say. I think the uh, reopening of the uh, negotiation or reopening the results of the uh, negotiation, that, that would be extremely difficult, and it's not really uh, practicable. Uh, but rather, you know, maybe exchange of uh, side letters to cover some tiny issues, uh, you know, um, not, does not require the parliamentary approval. Uh, maybe there's, there could be some room. But uh, uh, re renegotiation, uh, that would be extremely difficult, particularly after uh, Japanese diet passing through this uh, legislation for their ratifications on TPP. I see. Okay. Well. Yeah. Yes, Nogami-san. The uh, right, uh, you know, just immediately after, you know, the uh, very difficult uh, uh, session of uh, you know ratification of TPP, the, uh, the, uh, I think it's politically impossible to uh, c come back with this uh, modification or whatever you may call it. And also, this uh, you know, currency manipulation, uh, you know, narratives. Perhaps during the course of next week, uh, Fed may increase the rate, and the Japanese yen may depreciate. Who is culpable for this uh, depreciation of uh, yen? Uh, 
FET. The, uh, so uh, are you going to put up a surcharge on FET? So uh, anyway, so no, it's nothing this, uh, this is, uh, you know, this uh, currency manipulation argument uh, is no longer applicable to the uh, uh, country like Japan or the, uh, you, know, European, you know, European countries. You know, yeah. Market the rate is uh, dominating. Right. I mean, I think if they were some disciplines on this, it wouldn't be defined, you know, solely by the rate. It would be more uh, a question of building up of reserves mm. or current account surpluses mm. or, or trade surpluses would probably be uh, an inter intervention mm. in, the, in the market. Um, but Japan would, I, I agree today, would pass that test, all of those tests. Um, so, uh, okay, that's helpful. So uh, Kojima-san, and, and I know Nogami-san, you also have uh, thoughts on this, but um, you mentioned infrastructure. When I saw infrastructure on the summary version of your report first as one of the priorities, I thought you were talking about the U.S. and Japan cooperating on uh, infrastructure development in Asia or something, um, which is something, by the way, that the Simon Chair and CSAS are very focused on and, and very interested in. And you do talk about that, but it sounds like from our earlier conversation that the real uh, interest here is in um, is in uh, supporting infrastructure development in the United States. Uh, and w can you flesh out a little more, what can Japan offer in this regard to the United States? Because infrastructure is a very hot topic of conversation here and something where you know, there could be a new, uh, new investment, literally and figuratively, in that issue in the United States under a Trump administration. Okay, country by country, the infrastructure means a little bit different. In the case of the United States, I do think, well, for instance, uh, Shinkansen and- uh, Bullet train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a road train. It's, uh, uh, that is one of the subjects which, uh, say, Japan and the US is now discussing. And uh, particularly in the Eastern side and the Texas side, uh, maybe two or three projects are now under discussions. Therefore, uh, one of the infrastructure projects in the United States will be uh, this uh, railway a, a project, uh, Shinkansen. And also the other issue is the, uh, well, there are so many kinds of, uh, say, infrastructure things, but uh, we are now involved in the uh, globally water treatment infrastructure. And uh, water is also very important for everywhere, therefore from now on and uh, in United States water treatment, and also the uh, road constructions. And uh, also, this is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those three projects might be uh, uh, very interested in the United States. That's, that's my idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, that's helpful. Nogami-san, you had, again, mentioned yes. earlier this issue, and, and the, tell uh, us more, including about this federal and state right. question. The, uh, I think the infrastructure development uh, here in the United States will be basically carried out by various states. The, uh, and uh, the uh, 33 states have a uh, uh, mechanism for uh, pu public-private partnership. Not all of them, not all the states, but some. And all these uh, you know, PPP structures are slightly different from each other. And, uh, that is, so in order for us to have some sort of uh, uh, cooperation, uh, the, we have to have some you know, gov governmental platform or you, 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 what you call four-sided table or eight-sided table in, you know, involving uh, uh, the uh, state, uh, federal government and Japanese government and various state and some municipalities in you know, large cities. And uh, enterprise, the, 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 the companies which actually operate some of those projects. But one important player also, investor. Uh, Japanese institutional investors are very much interested in the, uh, the, uh, contributing some sort of uh, input, uh, financial input into this uh, eventual infrastructure development fund here. Uh, or, or be it uh, you know, federal level or a state level or a municipal level, we don't know. But uh, the one of the uh, 
fastest selling uh, financial products in Japan is uh, the uh, US Municipal Bond Investment Fund, which is rapidly expanding. And, uh, the, uh, and also, we have a huge pension fund, GPIF, $1.3 trillion in asset. And uh, uh, only 0.1% of that uh, GPIF money comes into this uh, infrastructure investment fund, 0.1%. Yeah. And so if that is increased to 1%, that is a huge money. $13 billion yes. or something. And, and the interest, sorry, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, the interest in this investment is the better return, the interest uh, differential that you could, right. these funds could, yes. uh, that, that these investors yes. could achieve through uh, investing in and, these funds. And also, seen from the U.S. Uh, user side, uh, it's a cheaper money. So it is a win-win situation. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I'm yes. outside uh, board of director of one of the uh, you know, Japanese insurance company. So, you know, so this company has a huge fund, institutional fund. But uh, you know, government you know, pressures them to sell the you know, Japanese you know, stock. So they're looking for new opportunities. You know, it could be a very attractive alternative uh, for the investment for institutional, you know, investors. Interesting. Um, uh, two more quick questions, and then I'll pull in the pull in the audience. Um, one, Ishiguro-san, I was going to ask you about. There's a section in here about um, strengthening our own economies and working to share share experience with um, dealing with. Um, issues of aging, to deal with womenomics, um, other, other um, sort of socioeconomic uh, uh, developments. Um, tell us more about what the idea is there, uh, what you think the US and Japan can do together. Um, I was a committee member of uh, um, uh, um, the cabinet office, so-called uh, the uh, choice for future. So that you know, so our role is to, you know, think about the, you know, how Japan is in 50 years. In 50 years. You know, the biggest problem is uh, depopulation. So aging society. You know, so our population will be in 50 years, two thirds of this current population, 120 million to 80 million. That is a disaster you know, shrink the GDP, you know, the solution to increase the productivity is one, to, you know, increase the labor market. You know, easy one is woman, get them back to the, you know, labor market. The second, the immigration. So immigration is a very touchy issue in Japan, up until so far. And uh, still controversial. But the U.S. now has, I don't know, the new you know, administration policy. Mm -hmm. You know, visa issue in Silicon Valley is already very hard. You know, our IT company set up an office. You know, just harder to get the visa, even for management, and give up to have a visa and leaving a country. That's reality, and I'm afraid your immigration policy is getting harder. If you, you know, Silicon Valley is supported, the power of Silicon Valley is supported by uh, immigrant, you know, Chinese, Indian, other countries. So if you kick them out, we will take it. You know who will be the winner. But we also understand we cannot do by ourselves. You know, all the product nowadays for IT has global supply chain. One person missing end up with a short supply of the product. We're not gonna do you know, everything by ourselves. We are ready to cooperate. We are ready to work with US company, especially in the US is a, again, dominant player for internet service. So I would encourage 
U.S. to you know, provide more, more visa for talented engineers and work with Japan to develop the best service, the best price to be a leader. I agree. That would be a good thing. Let's, let's see what happens in this uh, new administration on immigration. Um, it's going to be a charged debate, I think. Uh, although if there's any area where there may be some hope, it may be in that sort of area, but we'll see. Um, uh, what happened, so one quick thing. Do you want to say something about energy uh, and, and what the opportunities are? I guess I would have predicted a slightly different, again, before the election and after the election, what the focus of our energy cooperation might be, but what is the sort of key opportunities, do you think, for U.S. and Japan to cooperate on energy? Well, uh, in terms of energy, um, although it is not really my uh, specialty, but uh, the uh, clean energy and also uh, electricity generating, uh, that is also the area where Japan can certainly make contribution to. Um, I think, for instance, uh, <coughs> Japan has concluded by EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, with uh, uh, Mexico uh, some uh, 12 years ago, and uh, we enjoyed this 10 year of implementation of this bilateral one. And uh, uh, Japanese uh, companies have uh, uh, occasion to uh, uh, supply the, uh, you know, the power generator machinery uh, to uh, Mexican um, electricity company, which used to be uh, the state owned, and uh, that, therefore there was. Uh, uh, the uh, obligatory for Japanese companies to go through the, uh, uh, the go government procurement procedures, bidding procedures. But thanks to this EPA, uh, Japanese uh, suppliers could join this bidding procedures. Uh, and uh, we are now pro providing uh, Mexican uh, companies with a very uh, efficient uh, power generator machineries. So that is one example. But, uh, we can provide the clean energy and also uh, smart, uh, you know, the uh, electricity, uh, electricity generations. And in this kind of area, uh, Japan could certainly cope with, with U.S. needs. Since the Trump administration seems likely to be uh, even more focused on sort of fossil fuel uh, um, development, are there opportunities there, in, and not just in Japan bringing things in, but taking things out? Um, of the United States getting more exports of, you know, oil, gas, are these things that Japan's interested in? Maybe Nogami-san, if you have thought. Well, 1938 uh, U.S. Uh, Natural Gas Act prohibits the uh, exportation of uh, natural gas to the countries which U.S. does not have a free trade agreement. So but the, if a TPP is agreed upon, U.S. can, without license, export the, the gas, natural gas related. Another argument for TPP. Yes. Although waivers have been granted, yes. you know, uh, or licenses have been granted for some of those exports. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, there are lots of other topics covered in the report, and maybe some of you can help uh, me continue the questioning on some of those. Uh, so let me invite questions. If you have one, we do have microphones, so please wait for those, and please identify yourself and, uh, and ask a question. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, Hiroshi Hisazawa from National Defense University here in Washington, D.C. Um, my question is about trade and if there's any perspective of um, job creating uh, investment from Japan to the United States. Um, the, the problem uh, over here is that, um, first of all, we will be probably seeing more or, um, budget expenditure coupled with tax cuts which would turn into more budget deficit here in Washington, D.C., which from a macroeconomic uh, perspective would turn into a more trade deficit. And we will be seeing more of our, um, probably trade, um, trade wars, and which would turn um, into jobs uh, problems here in the United States. And from that perspective, um, if we were to, for example, repeat the, the investment that we had back in the 1980s, where lots of factories came over to the United States, that would alleviate, or at least some of the, what you call it, attacks on Japan um, from the uh, new administration, but at least uh, that will decrease the risk. And from that perspective, um, 
I'm wondering whether a repeat of 1980s, where we had more um, factory investment from Japan to the United States, is feasible. Thank you very much. Okay, do you want to try that, Nagami-san? Good question. I'm not really sure whether the uh, manufacturing uh, uh, sectors will come into the United States uh, uh, like we did uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, Japanese investment uh, into the United States will continue to grow in various fo different forms. Uh, merger and acquisition of uh, service companies, service sectors, and uh, as I explained, you know, the investment into this, uh, in the, uh, for instance, the infrastructure you know, investment fund. Uh, the, yes, uh, investment will increase, but not, I'm not really sure uh, how fast uh, manufacturing the investment you know, the, uh, would increase. Is there a worry that, I mean, sort of in the spirit of the question, that, that um, if our economic relations get, you know, more uh, uh, tense because of uh, growing trade deficits um, or other reasons? I mean, one, one concern on FDI is that, is that there may be closer scrutiny of, of foreign investment coming into the United States. I think that's more focused on China, but, uh, but is Japan at all worried about that? And is there something that, you know, that, that uh, we ought to be thinking about in that regard? I'm not really sure whether you know, the uh, Japanese uh, you know, the investment will be uh, scrutinized by CFS uh, because, uh, you know, not very much uh, related to the uh, national security issues. Uh, you know, the, for instance, uh, the Japanese companies uh, through margin, you know, margin acquisition, you know, getting some uh, local uh, insurance companies. I, I don't know whether CFS right. would come into this. There is talk of expanding the scope of CFIUS coverage to you know things that would be more like you know national economic security rather than national security. Um, uh, not sure that's going to happen. Definitely don't support it personally, but but I think that's possible that that could be the direction things could go. And so things and then of course just generally in the political process, it's, there's a risk there. I think. But um, okay, let me ask others to uh, to join in. The gentleman back there, and then this gentleman up here. My name is Guy Cheney. I'm an analyst with Media Partners. I have a, a question related to private sector companies. I know that uh, probably Ishiguro-san is, is, is well versed in dealing with the tech sector in Silicon Valley, and Kojima-san, Mitsubishi has a, a large exposure to, to international alliances, particularly with U.S. companies. What would your wish be for U.S. companies to advocate for to keep the relationship, uh, the business economic relationship between Japan and the U.S. on the front burner with the administration? Obviously, the Daijin has been very very effective at keeping uh, Japan as a high profile during this time of transition, but I'm curious, what would you want your U.S. partners to do? Thank you. What, what are your expectations for U.S. business to support the uh, a stronger relationship? Well, you know, I'm in the IT industry. I'm in the internet business. As I said, uh, internet, in terms of internet, U.S. is a winner, definitely, as a platformer, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook. Um, one of the things I um, would say, uh, you may think Japanese, um, Japanese market, Japanese industry is dominated uh, by big corporation. Mm -hmm. It's technically true, but uh, you know, like us, startup, you know, power of startup is increasing. Um, can you show the, um, this is a uh, number of IPO in Japan. So um, this is uh, October this year. You know, so this year's IPO will be, you know, so still, you know, November, December, it will be uh, more than, you know, last year. You know, IPO is, number of IPO growing. You know, IT company has a large portion of this. Um, you know, we are growing, but however, uh, in terms of uh, uh, private investment before IPO, you know, U.S. is a venture capital investment. U.S. is more than 20 times as much as 
one in Japan. Mm. You know, these companies are still small company. You know, I sometimes argue that even if we have a great engineer as a Google founder, we cannot have a Google in Japan because Google needs tremendous huge fund to support their infrastructure. A lot of servers, a lot of big you know, T1 access. You know, Japanese venture capital cannot really support for the fund. If we can collaborate you know, finance to the startup and the technology from Japan, could it be a you know, good opportunity to work together? Mm. Okay. Um, okay, sir. Hi, uh, Jack Caperell with Inside US Trade. And my question is if the Trump administration really does show no willingness to do uh, TPP and there's not much political will on the Japanese side to do a bilateral, uh, what then would be the best way to prevent the progress made between the two countries on trade from completely vanishing? And if it does become very apparent that the Trump administration is not willing to do TPP, would that maybe, um, not necessarily in two months, but maybe two or three years, create some urgency for a bilateral deal just out of uh, necessity? Okay, so if not plan A or plan B, what's plan C? And if and, and, and maybe we need to get back to plan B, I guess, is, is, the, is the question. Nagami-san and maybe Watanabe-san has views yeah, on we, that as well. We move ahead uh, with the Japan-EU uh, EPA. We have already uh, Japan-Australia uh, FTA. Uh, and uh, as a result of uh, Japan-Australia FTA, uh, I think uh, U.S. Uh, beef export to Japan would decrease if uh, TPP does not become, you know, come, come into force. For instance, U.S. Uh, export uh, of beef, uh, I think uh, the Japanese market is about a quarter, about a quarter of a U.S. total export. And uh, without TPP, U.S. will have to continue to pay 38.5% customs duty, whereas Australian beef will go down to 9%. And uh, so uh, this is the reality. The same would apply to pork. Same would apply to wine. And uh, the, uh, we can sustain, but what about U.S. exporters. So the, uh, uh, the, it's for the United States to decide. Uh, what about, um, I don't know, what time is Sensei, if you have anything to add to that, but if I can throw in another twist on that. What about, uh, there's talk here that if we don't do TPP, Japan and others are going to move off with China and ASEAN and do the RCEP, the regional comprehensive economic <laughs> partnership. Is that likely to happen, and is that something the U.S. should be worried about? Well, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. <laughs> and thank you very much for the question from the floor, gentleman from uh, inside U.S. trade. Uh, I'm particularly happy because, uh, you know, uh, in my seminar course, every day, I mean, every week, uh, we uh, monitor uh, your newspaper. Very close. <laughs> so the students, uh, you know, my students, undergraduates even, uh, they know about inside U.S. trade, and uh, you deliver very legitimate, good uh, articles all the time. Well, uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, I'd like to uh, mention that we have uh, uh, already 15 uh, economic partnership agreements, and that cover roughly 22 or 23% of our external trade. Uh, in addition, as uh, Ambassador Nogami mentioned, that we are now negotiating and now it's getting into the final phase with the European Union. So uh, also we are uh, uh, participating in the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which is essentially 10 of ASEAN nations plus JCK, Japan, China, Korea, plus Australia, New Zealand, and India. So it's a, it's a 16 country endeavor to make uh, freer trade. Um, 
But you see, uh, often uh, you know, question being asked that uh, we should choose whether TPP or RCEP, which is uh, uh, more you know pr prioritized, which is more important than the other. To Japan, it is not really the uh, proper question to be asked, because uh, we need uh, TPP and, as well as RCEP. Um, for instance, the uh, for FDI, the uh, TPP destination covers roughly 46% of Japanese FDI going abroad, while uh, external trade uh, also 45% uh, goes to uh, destination of RCEP member states. So you see, if you take both FDI and the international trade, those are the two sides of the one flip coin. So uh, we need both. But actually, the, what is more important to know is that the TPP is the kind of leading uh, agreement because you see in terms of maturity, in terms of uh, uh, you know, what they can deliver, uh, TPP is far ahead of RCEP. So RCEP has a meaning provided that TPP moving on. Uh, so TPP leads all other um, mega FTAs such as RCEP, such as JCK trilateral FTA, and also TTIP across the Atlantic. So I think the, uh, you know, uh, for the time being, Japan is certainly giving priority to TPP, and we have so far no plan B, you see. TPP should be established. And um, uh, provided that TPP moving ahead, then RCEP will follow, you see. So that is a kind of sequence that we have been looking at, you see. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, for the time being, we will stick uh, our imp importance to uh, the uh, completion of TPP. Can, can to either of you or any of you, can APEC be helpful? Is that another area that we should be in the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum uh, where we have worked together well uh, in the past? It's not a binding negotiation, but it does, you know, expand and extend uh, norms and, and good behavior or practices. Um, is APEC useful? Is that something we should be emphasizing more? Yes, what time is May it? I? Um, well, looking at very closely what APEC delivered uh, this year, uh, particularly you know, listening to uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's uh, uh, interventions, he mentioned about FTAAP, Free Trade Area of Asia Pacific. And that is very far reaching, you see. And that means, and you know, how we should read this message. He didn't mention so much about RCEP. That China has been saying that their priority is on RCEP. But he didn't mention so much about RCEP this year. So how should we read or interpret this, uh, you know, uh, this tendency? One interpretation is that maybe you know, they are you know, watching or monitoring that TPP is kind of fading away. Then. China themselves, they lost the uh, initiatives uh, or they lost the uh, motivation to proceed their own liberalization in trade and investment. You see, uh, this is really uh, very, very negative uh, for the entire development of international trading community if China you know, goes back into kind of uh, more protective trade. See. Yeah. So I think this is one of the most important element that we should think about, you know, the risk that we should think about if really TPP is going to be faded away. Let, let me ask one more follow-up question to get to the question about, uh, about a bilateral FTA. Would Japan be willing to accept a 30-year phase-out of auto tariffs in the United States under a bilateral deal? What's the difference between 25 and 30? 25, <laughs> fine. I thought it was 25 and 30 uh, parts and full autos and parts. The I'm getting to how difficult it, in practice it's going to be, obviously, to, to do a bilateral FTA. There's going to be some devil in the detail, right? Well, of course, uh, you know, we are not exporting a huge amount of uh, sugar and sugar products to the United States. but. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, you know, the sugar content of, for instance, take a kamaboko, you know. The kamaboko has a, uh, uh, the... Uh, Sorry, I'm not sure how to translate a kamaboko, but <laughs> someone help. <laughs> I don't think it does. Sorry? It's a fish cake. Fish cake. Fish cake, yeah. okay. That's good enough. <laughs> the, uh, 
the fish cake has a very high uh, content of uh, sugar, and uh, the tariff rate is extremely high. And so uh, those things, you know, the, I think American consumers perhaps don't know, but uh, the, uh, uh, we don't produce peanut butter, we don't, peanut, we don't produce the jellies, but uh, nonetheless, those contain a huge percentage of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tariff. And uh, yet, uh, you know, the, uh, so we may be asking all these questions, you know, what about your, but TPP has balanced out all these different aspects of bilateral deals. But uh, on purely bilateral basis, I, I think it's going to be a, you know, back to old uh, acrimonious days, uh, you know, bilateral. You know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think a bilateral channel uh, is really a sort of a productive channel. Uh, it sounds good. You know, I, I can make a you know, bigger deal out of this, but uh, it's, I think it's less productive uh, than this, uh, you know, the, the way we, we negotiated TPP. There's your headline for, for your story, or your sound bite. Um, yes, sir. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Hiroyuki Nakashima from Japan Bank for International Cooperation, JBIC. I have a quick, one quick question is, um, I, I, I might have missed these mediums the new era. If the new era means the uh, new administration in the United States, um, did you have any modification of the, uh, the proposal after the election, US election, the president, or the many changes to the stress of the proposal among the, these four peers? Um, if there is such kind of a discussion, I, um, I w we would like to have the, the brief explanation. Thank you. Did, did it change um, yeah. because of the election result, nagami -san? We started the study group uh, before the election outcomes, but we finalized uh, the report after the election. So uh, the, uh, and uh, of course, there are many elements, different uh, elements uh, within the draft you know, process, but the final output, final product is compiled after the election. And the new era means not the new administration. The new era means different economic background. You mean a challenging global, you yeah. talk in the introduction about a challenging global economic environment with a slow growth and um, uh, new players yeah. and so forth. So that's what you mean by new era. Oh. kojima -san. As I explained to you, the, uh, this, uh, you know, Teamwork started the, the September. At that time, the, the before the election, and the before uh, Trump uh, started, and uh, therefore at that time, say the uh, Japanese government uh, has uh, seriously uh, worrying about the uh, future economic situations. For that purpose, uh, what we should do it. The new era means uh, uh, mm -hmm. nothing to do with this. Uh, say. U.S. elections, but for the Japanese, and the, not only Japan, but the globally, economic situation is now changing. Now the time, particularly for Japan, to you know improve the total situation, and uh, that's the reason why the September, this uh, study team started, and uh, we discussed very seriously about that. That's the result of that report. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ira. Ambassador Shapiro, and then the lady there. I appreciated the point that there is uh, no plan B beyond TPP. Um, frankly, many of us who have spoken and written about TPP and the importance of it for several years um, have been somewhat shocked by not just the election result, but the whole tenor of our trade debate. And I would hope that we will continue, uh, and I would hope that you would continue, to press the incoming administration uh, on the importance of TPP. Um, I understand the, the president-elect's position, but I also think that the president-elect is talking to a range of people and still putting together his team. 
And I think that while we have to anticipate continued opposition, I think the logic of TPP for the, from, for, from the standpoint of the United States is so compelling uh, and so much more reasonable a course than going off and negotiating endless bilaterals, which we have proven in the past that we don't do very well. We neither negotiate them nor do we ultimately approve them very quickly. So I would hope, and I guess this is a comment rather than a question, that the efforts of all of us would be still focused on trying to make the case for TPP with necessary modifications, as Matt commented, if needed. But I have to say that looking at it from the outside, you know, many of us have been concerned about the U.S. as an increasingly unreliable trading partner. And nothing could be more a dramatic illustration than walking away from something that we had all negotiated together. Okay, we'll take that as a comment. That's a, a good one. Yes, ma'am, right next to you, Michelle. Yeah. Hello, my name is Sanjin Choi, Langham Partners. Can I follow up with a, a free trade agreement, bilateral free trade agreement? A, what are current status of Japan um, EU free trade agreement with regard to automobile and agriculture? B, is there any lessons learned from EU and Canada free trade agreement? And of course, in the EU, our Japanese trade is three times higher than EU and Canadian trade agreement. How, how can you avoid the last people we have experienced past months? Thank you. Did you follow that? Yeah. Difficulty uh, that the EU-Canada agreement uh, faced uh, is, if I may say, accidental. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, I think, uh, Japan EU free trade agreement uh, will be uh, once once agreed upon between you know, the two parties. I think we I don't think we'll have to go through a difficult uh, ratification process. They will go for this fast track approach. Uh, they have learned a lesson. Uh, Brussels learned a lesson. <coughs> That's one thing. And uh, Japan uh, EU. Uh, FTA. Yes, there are still uh, some uh, uh, areas of uh, difference of opinion, but uh, we are hoping that uh, we'll be able to get to the sort of basic agreement by the end of this year, during the course of this month. Uh, the, uh, this has, well, in a way, this is a TPP effect. Because, because of a change of position of the U.S. administration on TPP, we are pushing uh, uh, Japan, EU, free FTA. It's thanks to this yeah. change of mood, we got the boost. And I, I think from a U.S. perspective, you know, sort of mixed feelings about that because obviously we're missing out. It just highlights how we're missing out on uh, the opportunities that uh, Japan and the EU are going to seize together. On the other hand, if the U.S. and uh, if Japan and the EU are going to help advance. Uh, through other means, some of the, the high standards that we were trying to achieve in TPP, that's a good thing. And just on that subject, I think as long as we are unable here to get back to TPP, and I think we should, uh, but uh, it, it, you know, during this period when we're having this debate here in the U.S., I think Japan, from a U.S. perspective, we lose out on some commercial opportunities, but in terms of the rulemaking process, Japan's moving forward through its various um, efforts in, with the EU, the trilateral with Korea and, uh, and China, um, and even RCEP, um, trying to you know, move forward some of those high standards that are in the basic agreement of uh, text of TPP, I think would be, you know, would be a good thing for us. Second best, but, uh, but, but better than, uh, than Japan standing back and waiting for us to, uh, to come back uh, to lead this, these discussions. So I, I personally think Japan has got a very important role over the next couple of years, even if we're unable to get back to TPP. Okay, did I see another hand somewhere? Any other, uh, any other questions? Um, 
Uh, does anyone, was there anything we left out of the report that you think we should have? Oh, is there another? I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you. Um, my name is Kunio Kikuchi, and uh, I'm with Washington Research and Analysis. Um, my question is to Mr. Kojima and perhaps to Ms. Uh, Ishiguro. Um, Every year when I look at the largest and most profitable companies in Japan, uh, your company, Mr. Kojima, is right at the top, uh, if not the very top, within the top 10. And so are a number of other large so-called trading companies. Uh, when I came to the US 60 years ago, 50 years ago, <clears throat> I explained trading companies to be essentially uh, companies that facilitate trade uh, by their uh, richness of information. And certainly that advantage, uh, I think, has disappeared largely during the past 10 years, especially when individual manufacturers can readily uh, gain information about markets around the world. So my question to Mr. Kojima is, how has the business model of these largest companies in Japan changed? Uh, what, who are the counterpart uh, large corporations in the United States that could be called uh, trading companies? And uh, to Ms. Ishiguro, have you included trading companies in the 50-year model? Are they, as they exist today, still sustainable 50 years from now? Thank you. Okay, well, say, trading company is only in Japan right now. And, uh, but uh, we used to be a trading business, but the trading profit is uh, just 20 to 30 percentage. 70 to 80 percentage profit coming from the investment. Then uh, if I explain like this, everybody says, no, Trading company business model now changing to the uh, investment banker. No. We invest not only money, but also human resources. We invest and uh, say more than, um, uh, in total, more than 1,200 investment company throughout the world. All say uh, invest more than 30 percentage. And, uh, uh, we can get the profit from the investment company by dividend or uh, by, say, investment. And uh, the important issue is invest money and afterwards we send somebody from our company to those uh, subsidiary companies. And therefore, maybe now we send more than 200 CEO from our company to the subsidiary companies throughout the world. And uh, the important issue is how to add the value for the, the subsidiary companies throughout the world. That's a very important thing. How to educate the management to capable uh, employee. And uh, therefore, it used to be, say, when our companies employ uh, younger generations, they don't like to go to the subsidiary company. But these days, they like to go to subsidiary companies before the 30 years old. They like to study the management itself. That's a very good you know, situation right now. Therefore, how to educate the management people, that is our business model right now. And uh, since uh, now the training company business model is good, but uh, China and Korea try to copy it, but they cannot do it because basically we have more than 200 offices in 90 countries in the world. They cannot make it from the beginning. But from the beginning, we are trading company. For the trading purpose, we need so many offices in the world. And the changing the business model including those 200 offices. Therefore, we can develop this kind of business almost all over the world and all industries. It's not so easy. Therefore, 
it, uh, it's uh, very difficult for us to say the, uh, who, is the, who can copy the uh, trading company in the United States. No company like that. That is a real situation. For the, therefore, trading company, so this name is something wrong. <laughs> Business investment uh, enterprise or something like that. Okay, <laughs> very interesting, very very helpful. Ishiguro-san, last word. Well, you know, the, he said the trading company has <laughs> changed the kind of business model. Uh, I don't have to, you know, so kind of, you know, say, you know, so trading company exists in 50 years or not because it's they're changing the business model. Um, I like to add some <coughs> comment in terms of uh, internet. Um, Internet trade only take the you know so the let's say five percent of all retail market, still very small portion. It would be a ten percent in few years. It's large, but uh, internet does not exist by itself. We more appreciate user experience. Let's say Amazon's vision is to become a company to the best company for users. So this concept is very important. So someone still want to buy the product at a shop, real store, um, so-called omnichannel. We are going to, you know, we are now promoting the concept as, you know, Provide the information whatever, wherever user want to, wherever, which device, and provide the chance to buy wherever they want, you know, after the purchase as well. So user is selfish. So internet cannot help everything. So especially for the international trade, you know, we need more logistics. So there's a large portion still the existing company play a role. So we need their help. So. Excellent. Well, this is a topic we need to have a separate event on because I'm very interested in all of that. Um, but, um, but we do have to stop now. Um, let me just say that you've given us a lot of uh, really uh, useful food for thought and I think for uh, an agenda for the U.S. and Japan going forward. I personally think it's going to be really important for the U.S. and Japan. If you look around the world uh, from a U.S. perspective, there aren't a lot of other countries that have the combination of, of capacity, uh, shared sort of vision, shared um, uh, interests, uh, frankly, in, uh, uh, and, and an ability to, 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 to work with us and sort of work on things that we, we think are important here uh, other than Japan. And so I actually think this is a really important to, uh, issue for us all to work on. We're going to be doing that in the Simon Chair and fleshing out other ideas and some of these ideas um, going forward. But we really thank you for, for your ideas and for your participation. Please join me in uh, thanking everyone. And, and the good news of those of you who stuck around this long is that we have a wine and cheese reception. Cheese, am I right to offer cheese? Yes. Uh, wine and cheese reception right outside here.